Welcome. You all know the effect of kryptonite on Clark Kent. I'm rather hoping that this video will have a similar effect on Piers Corbin. A few days ago I stumbled across this video where Piers Corbin was interviewed about his views on global warming, the possibility of a coming ice age and the status of the sun. He frankly made some very ridiculous uh, statements about each of these topics and I want to take them on and show you where the truth really lies. Piers Corbyn has several claims to fame, apart from being the brother of the leader of the opposition in the UK Parliament. And by the way, he can't even persuade his own brother that his views on global warming are correct. He claims to be an astrophysicist. He isn't. He published one paper on the formation of galaxies back in 1984 but it was in a conference proceedings, which means he went to the conference and gave a talk or a poster and then just wrote up what he said. Such papers have little or no refereeing and so not considered scientific publications. He's often called doctor or even professor by some of his hosts. I'm sorry, it's just plain mister. He failed to get his PhD. And he never corrects his hosts when they say such things. He claimed to understand how the Japanese earthquake was caused. According to him, it was by a combination of a supermoon and a coronal mass ejection from the sun. I did a video about this some years ago showing what absolute nonsense that is. Uh, it's worth looking up if you're interested. He claims to know basic science. He doesn't, as I will adequately demonstrate several times during this uh, presentation. He makes wild claims about the accuracy of his weather forecasting playing up the few successes and ignoring any failures. This is the same technique used by horoscope uh, providers. So all in all, he's giving the impression of a being a complete charlatan. So why did I have a problem with this particular video? Well, Corbin during it makes several basic scientific errors. He says some really stupid things. For example, adding more CO2 to the atmosphere will not result in more CO2 in the atmosphere. Now just think about that for a second. Time's up. Next he says the sun is driving global warming via the oceans and it is thus increasing the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which he just said was impossible. He also claims that past sunspot records indicate that we are about to go into a new ice age. Well, what we're going to do is take each one of these points in turn and look where the truth really lies. His argument that by adding more carbon dioxide to the atmosphere doesn't result in more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is frankly bizarre. It's sort of like new maths where 1 plus 1 does not equal 2. In fact, according to him, it seems to equal 1. His argument goes as follows. There's more carbon dioxide in the oceans than in the air. The air is saturated with carbon dioxide. So if you add more carbon dioxide to the air, it will be absorbed by the ocean. Now let's take a look at each one of these in turn. Indeed, there is more carbon dioxide in the oceans than in the air, but there's some qualification to that statement. The air is saturated with carbon dioxide. That is absolute nonsense, and apparently doesn't even understand uh, the Dalton law of partial pressures, which is one of the most basic laws of gas physics. He also claims that by adding more carbon dioxide to the air, more will be absorbed into the oceans. That's true, but it's misleading because there's a word missing. And the word that's missing is eventually. The rate of absorbing carbon dioxide into the oceans is slow. So to find out whether more carbon dioxide accumulates in the air, you have to compare the rate at which carbon dioxide is being put into the air with the rate that is being removed from the air by the oceans. So if more carbon dioxide is going into the air than is being removed by the oceans, the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere will increase. Now he doesn't do that calculation as any decent scientist would. So his conclusions are wrong. We can immediately see there's something screwy with his arguments if we look at the history of carbon dioxide over the last 300 years. This plot initially starts out from ice cores and then is done by from 1957 onwards is done with uh, direct measurements of concentration of atmospheric carbon dioxide. Now when there's a cold period or low solar activity temperature should drop and the solubility of carbon dioxide should increase so the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere should dip. Similarly when there's a high temperature period or high solar activity 
the temperature of the ocean should increase according to Corbin and so there should be a, a, a peak in carbon dioxide as more carbon dioxide is boiled off of the oceans. So let's take a look at some of those periods. We had the Maunder minimum back at the beginning of the 18th century and so there should be a big dip there and there isn't. We had the Dalton minimum at the beginning of the 19th century which was caused by two large volcanic eruptions and so there should be a big dip there and in fact if anything there's a slight peak. In 1940 we had some very warm temperatures globally and so there should be a peak there. There isn't. We had high solar activity in the 1950s uh, so that should uh, have boiled off some more carbon dioxide so there should be a peak there. There isn't. In 1998 we had a record El Nino so that should have boiled off a lot of carbon dioxide so there should be a peak there and there isn't. In 2015 and 2016 we had another large El Nino so there should be a peak there and there isn't. So his argument completely breaks down compared to the record. Let's take a look at the carbon cycle. This is one of my favorite pictures of the carbon cycle because it has all the numbers on it. You can see that the atmosphere has 800 gigatons of carbon in it. The surface of the ocean has another 1000 gigatons of carbon. Deep down we have 37,000 gigatons more of carbon and at the very base of the ocean we have a further 6,000 gigatons of carbon. So put that all together and you have 44,000 gigatons of carbon in the ocean compared to just 800 gigatons in the atmosphere. So Corbin was right. There's far more carbon in the oceans than there is in the atmosphere. In fact, it was a ratio of 55 to 1. But what he didn't mention was that humans are emitting 9 gigatons of carbon per year compared with 90 gigatons of carbon being emitted by the ocean. So the ocean is emitting 10 times the amount of carbon than humans are. However, simultaneously, they're absorbing 92 gigatons of carbon. So they're absorbing everything that they've emitted plus two of the gigatons that, uh, that humans have emitted. Land is doing the same thing. It's taking out yet another three gigatons of carbon of ours. So put that all together. You have a gross emission from humans of nine gigatons per year but a net emission of carbon at 4 gigatons, which will accumulate each year in the atmosphere. So next year we would have 804 gigatons in the atmosphere, the following year we'd have 808, the following year we'd have 812. And that's why carbon dioxide is building up in the atmosphere. How do we know it's going into the oceans? Well, we can measure the ocean acidity and the ocean is getting more acidic. And that corresponds to the amount of carbon that would have gone into the oceans uh, during that period of time. A good scientist should know that you can't draw conclusions from a single source of information when there are others available to cross-check. This seems to be what Corbin has done. Let's take a look at some of those other sources of information. You can do simple accounting, i.e. measure the amount of fossil fuels that are burned each year and convert that to amount of carbon emitted and you'll find that that corresponds to the 9 gigatons of human emissions that I mentioned earlier. If we're burning carbon, then the amount of oxygen in the air should be dropping, and indeed it is. We've already found out that the oceans are absorbing more carbon dioxide than they're emitting, so the source of the carbon dioxide cannot be from the oceans. Apparently, Corbin doesn't even understand the basics about isotopes. If he did, he would understand that fossil fuels have about 2% less carbon-13 than natural plants and the oceans do. And so if we're burning fossil fuels, you'd expect the isotope carbon-13 to be falling in the atmosphere. And indeed it is. We also know that temperature rises on the Earth are erratic. There's lots of bumps and wiggles. And if the temperature was driving the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, those bumps and wiggles would be reflected in the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and it isn't. So Corbin has failed to follow the basic scientific procedures to come up with his conclusions and that's why they're wrong. Corbin has made several predictions of an upcoming ice age going over the last decade based mainly on his understanding of the sun which I would assert is minimal. In 2010 there's an article saying that Piers Corbin is claiming that it's going to be an imminent ice age. 
In 2013, he's quoted as saying, is the ice age is upon us, i.e. it's happening. The only problem is when you look at the data for that time frame, you'll see something quite remarkable. Namely that six of the ten warmest years on record have all occurred since he made that initial prediction. So I'm not having very much faith in any of his forecasts, particularly if they're associated with climate or with the sun. He keeps claiming it's the sun that's causing all of this. And as a solar physicist, I object to that. He claims that the sun heats the oceans. That is true. He, oceans determine the climate. That is also true. The sun has been very active in the last hundred years. Not true. There's been a couple of periods where it was quite active during the 40s and the 50s, but since then activity levels have been dropping quite significantly. He claims that the sun is boiling carbon dioxide out of the seas. Now that we've just established is not in fact the case. So that's wrong. He now says that the sun is going into a grand solar minimum without any evidence of that being the case. And if it does, he claims it will have an ice age. There's been no link between a grand solar minimum and an ice age. So that's wrong as well. Now let's take a look to see whether there's a correlation between global temperatures and solar activity. Global temperatures here are shown with a solid red curve averaged by an 11 year solar cycle. And the blue curve below is the solar irradiance based on the sunspot number, which is shown in the back here in a lighter blue color. And as you can see, from the 1960s onwards, solar activity seemed to be dropping uh, quite steadily. Whereas at the same time, uh, global temperatures seem to be rising. So that's the exact opposite trend to what uh, Corbin would su suggest. We can go a bit further by adding in uh, a arrow wherever there was a peak in the solar cycle and seeing whether there was a pronounced bump in the uh, amount of uh, global temperatures. And there really there isn't. Uh, equally, back in 2009, uh, 2008 and 2009, we had one of the longest and lowest uh, solar uh, minima on record. And was there a big dip in the um, global temperatures? No, there wasn't. And in fact, 2009 at the time was the second warmest year on record. It's now the eighth, though. The next part I call dishonest cycles. Corbin shows the following plot and claims that this proves that we're going to be going into a grand solar minimum anytime soon. And it says it corresponds to his particular calculations. Now, I'm sure some of you, if not all of you, have noticed there's a problem with this plot. In fact, a high school uh, student should realize there is a, a problem with this plot. Let me explain. Here we have a period according to the plot of 30 years. So I'll put that in a box up to the left here, 30 years. Next we have down below a period of 50 years. You notice the period of 50 years is actually shorter than the period uh, of 30 years. Here we have a 90 year period, which is shorter than the 30 year period. Here we have a 60 year period, which is shorter than the 50 year period. And here we have a 25 year period, which turns out is almost right. So what I did is I assumed that this distance from here to here was 220 yards and then calculated how long each one of those arrows ought to be. And I've done that and put the is black arrows on the plot and you can see that none of them correspond to the scale that they should have had. So what has happened here is that they've concertinaed the time scales in some places and stretched it in others to make the two plots look uh, alike. So this is pure dishonesty. You couldn't make this mistake by accident. And if Pierce claims to be some sort of scientist, he would have known that. So to use this to make his case and to say it corresponds to his own calculations means that he's being completely and utterly dishonest in trying to use this to make his point that we're going into a grand solar minimum and thus an ice age. 
Let's replace this fake data with some real data. Here is Corbin's fake sunspot plot, which is shown in blue. And I'm going to over plot the real sunspot data for this same time period. Now what I've done here is I've matched the start and stop times and matched the amplitude at the beginning and at this peak in 1940. And when you do that, you can see there's absolutely no correspondence between these two graphs. In fact, there's nothing you can do to either graph apart from doing more concertina work to make them even look remotely the same. Corbin then goes on to talk about this projection that was on the original graph that shows that we're about to go into a new mortar minimum and thus a new ice age. But this plot, this blue plot, was done in 1998 and we have 20 years more data. Let's take a look and see what that shows us. So there's the plot and that's the extra 20 years that we've got added. And you can see where he has a huge peak uh, in the plot, we have a dip. So there's absolutely no reason to, at all to believe that this rest of this red curve is going to happen. So there's no reason to believe that we're going into a Maunder minimum, and there's no reason, to, even if we did, to believe that that would cause an ice age of any sort. So this is all complete and utter nonsense that he's talking about. And again, if he was any form of real scientist, he would know that. I think the moral lesson from this whole thing is that you can ignore anything that Corbin says. He has no expertise in climatology. He's not even an astrophysicist as he claims to be. His solar and climate forecasts have been an absolute disaster. He doesn't even seem to understand basic physics like Dalton's law of partial pressures or about isotopes. And he relies on fraudulent graphs for his evidence that we're going into a grand solar minimum and consequently an ice age. My advice to anybody is ignore him completely. So until next time, goodbye.